I remember it vividly. It was December of 2011. I was 15 years old and was in my sophomore year of high school. Like many people my age, I practically lived on the internet. And at the time, there was a great amount of hype surrounding this story of some kind. A webcomic, I would hear. Everywhere I looked, I would see people discussing this story. They would talk about their favorite characters. They would post weird gifts of gray people with horns. When pressed about it, they would tell you to go read the story, as it was amazing, albeit a bit long. So one cold winter day, I decided to bite the bullet. I was bored and had nothing really better to do. I opened up my web browser and typed mspainadventures.com into the address bar. I hit the enter button and thought nothing of it as the page loaded. It was a seemingly insignificant action, and I had no idea that the webcomic I was about to read was going to change my life forever. While it may seem like an exaggeration that a piece of media could affect me to that extent, it's honestly true. For the next several years, this comic would dominate my everyday life. To put it simply, I had a very deep obsession. I mean sure, I was a fan of a bunch of other things, but this webcomic, it was different. It was unlike anything I had ever experienced before. For the next decade, there wouldn't be one day that went by where I didn't at least think about the story, for better or worse. On that fateful afternoon I loaded up MS Paint Adventures, I wasn't just going to read a webcomic. I was going to read Homestuck. Oh, hello there. My name is Brad. I'm what you may call a Homestuck fan. Okay, that's not entirely accurate. It is true I was once a dedicated enthusiast. I even liked the comic so much I read it like seven times. I am not kidding. Okay, I should clarify that I've read the good part seven times. I only ever read the final quarter exactly once as it was coming out. That's because as the comic went on, I started hating it more and more until I despised it. When the story was over, I was done. For years after, I was very conflicted. I didn't know what my overall opinion of the comic was, but one thing I was sure of was that I was bitter. So I decided to sort out my feelings once and for all. In December of 2021, exactly 10 years after I read Homestuck for the first time, I read it for the last time. I wanted to see what my 25-year-old self would think compared to my 15-year-old self. And that brings us to this review. This is going to be my final will and testament on Homestuck. I figure it's going to be a form of therapy. After this, I can finally move on with my life. And I am aware that other people have already reviewed Homestuck. Like Linkara. The great Linkara. Hey, jackass! The trolls weren't in Act 1. Fucker. But this is something I have to do for myself. So are you ready to come with me on an adventure of a lifetime? Probably not, but let's go anyway. Now you may think I'm going to dive straight into Homestuck. That's a mistake that many people make. But I don't think you could truly appreciate Homestuck without knowing a bit about its author, Andrew Hussey, and his previous works. It'd be like trying to explain Sonichu without talking about Chris Chan's life first. You might find that to be a pretty stupid comparison now, but just wait. These two might have more in common than you think. So who is this douchebag? Well, Andrew Hussey was born on August 25th, 1979. He would grow up alongside his younger brother Byron. Together they would watch great shows like ALF and Star Trek The Next Generation. They would also watch a lot of shitty movies, and I guess they played with weird puppets too. Hussey's journey to becoming a big webcomic artist started at the age of 11, when he made a regular comic named Super Frog. The comic's plot revolves around some mob boss wanting to steal science from the science plant. Very gripping stuff. Eventually, Hussey got bored with writing the story and just drew a map. Unfortunately, Hussey's teachers gave him less than a warm reception for his efforts. Over the rest of his school days, his art skills would improve and eventually he became pretty good. But in spite of his growing artistic talents, Hussey decided to go to college for something more practical. He attended Temple University and graduated with a degree in computer science. Though the only real job he got with his programming knowledge was working for his dad, also conveniently named Andrew Hussey. Hussey Sr. spent most of his life as a journalist. After he retired from that, he dedicated the rest of his life to studying color theory. He founded a company named Master Colors, and Hussey, uh, Hussey Jr. I mean, worked there as the chief technical officer. While working there, Hussey created a Photoshop plugin that helped artists pick harmonic colors. Which is to say, colors that look really good together. Also, don't rip them off because this is patented. This color technology would later find use in the medical industry to detect cancer. I guess Andrew Hussey has actually saved lives, who knew? But when he wasn't saving people with the power of color, he was working on his own projects. 
The 2000s were a busy time for a big-lipped friend. He had a lot of irons in the fire, you could say, and I would punch you in the face for doing so. He had a group of buddies that he frequently collaborated with called the Gang Bunch. Byron was part of this group too. He and Andrew created several home movies and shared them with everyone. First, let's look at their zombie flick, Fatal Revenge 2. It's practically unwatchable. Okay, forget about that one. Behold, the Barty's Brouhaha series. Byron stars as Barty Anderson, a public access TV show host who hunts for the Bigfoot. Though in the first installment, the Bigfoot hunts him. Andrew appears in the second installment, where he plays a character named Stuart Clamington, a man obsessed with Barty. Later on, he kills him in cold blood. But don't worry, Barty magically survives. However, he's paralyzed. In this third installment, Andrew once again co-stars, this time as Barty's brother Cash. Cash nurses Barty back to health, and later runs him over with his car. As you can tell, I'm a big Barty scout. Yes, that's what the fandom name is called. But this series is mostly Byron's. So let's get back on track and talk about something Andrew did. Let's talk about his blog. He got up to some pretty crazy shenanigans on here. First, he went on a journey of trying to get an Olive Garden coupon from shady pop-up ads. Do you remember pop-up ads? Do you remember George W. Bush? I don't. He also went on a giant rant about figurines that he called Fancy Santas. Listen, you imposter. You are not Kris Kringle. Put down the wreath, take off your silly robes, and go home. This dude thinks he's Gandalf the White. Jesus Christ, he's so fucking pure, I bet every time he bends over, a flock of white doves flaps frantically out of his ass. This one is riding a fucking bear. Go to hell, numbnuts. This fancy Santa seriously needs to just go fuck off. Now, he didn't just write about inane nonsense, though. He once attempted to write a whole book. Here's Wizardy Herbert and the Mobius Slipknot. It starts off as a Harry Potter parody, then slowly gets more and more crazy. I think Hussey finds wizards to be fucking stupid. He wants to face a book called Wizardology, where he riffed on the entire thing. You're welcome. But when he wasn't writing, he was teaming up with his friend Jan Van Den Hamel to create Jandrew Edits of Star Trek The Next Generation. Basically, these were really fancy YouTube poops. The Federation's gone! The Borg is everywhere! Yes, this is all very interesting, number one. Please, you've got to help us! They also made one where Alf gets raped. It was really highbrow stuff. He also liked to review furry porn. I hope you like art, dinosaurs, and cock as much as I do. Oh, hussy. That's impossible. But he also critiqued normal art pieces. And by normal, I mean these abominations. This particular piece is pretty special. Hussy liked this painting of a horse attacking a football player so much that he bought the original for a paltry sum of $425. Luckily for Hussy, fans gave him $300 to help him pay for it. And this wouldn't be the last time people foolishly gave money to Andrew Hussey, I can tell you that. Now, if he thought your webcomic sucked, he'd straight up make an exaggerated parody of it. For example, he saw this really shitty comic called Shredded Moose, and decided to make something called Cool Dude and Stoner Lou in retaliation. But the more famous case is what he made after he saw a little webcomic called Higher Technology. It was one of those Penny Arcade-inspired, two gamers on a couch type comics. Because God knows we need another one of those. It wasn't very promising. So Hussey swooped in with Sweet Bro and Hello Jeff. Next to Homestuck, this is Hussey's most famous property. In fact, you've probably seen it even if you haven't read Homestuck. But what about his own comics? Well, unlike most critics, Hussey could actually put his fan-donated money where his mouth was, because he was actually a pretty damn good artist by this point. In 2003, he, Byron, and their friend Beetlejuice started a website called Team Special Olympics to host their webcomics. I know, what a charming title. Hussey at this time went by the username of Special Olympics as well, though it was usually shortened to S underscore O. Byron would later quit the site, leaving only Hussey and Beetlejuice, who unfortunately would turn out to be a woman named Cindy Marie instead of being Michael Keaton. Team Special Olympics had three major comic categories. Features, which took the most effort, blurbs, which took a little less, and scriblets, which took the least. Let's look at Hussey's features. Frankly, I don't have much to say about most of them. Like, here's one called How to Embarrass a Duck. Okay, how about Hooray for Church? Well, this panel is kind of cool, but that's it. Here's the more popular of these works. This is Neon Ice Cream Headache. The premise is that there's a drug that gives you a headache, but lets you go into TV shows. You can also come back out, but this pops you out of many TVs. Then your clones fight to the death. 
Unfortunately, this series ends on a cliffhanger. There's also And It Don't Stop, which is one of the better ones. It's a comic about giant rapping robots before Madverse City made it cool. The rap battles here are pretty interesting. They're part of a competition called Tech Hop. There are two factors that the raps must adhere to. The first is called Groove, which is the theme that the rap must follow. The second is called Shade, which is a word that the lyrics must rhyme with. Hussey's biggest feature was a comic called Whistles the Starlight Calliope. This one actually got printed by Slave Labor Graphics. It's about an innocent clown named Whistles who's extremely loyal to his ringmaster, who happens to be a cannibal that tried to execute him. Whistles goes crazy, kills a lot of people, and gets into prostitution. Classic Hussey. Unfortunately, it was never finished. Of course, these comics that had a lot of effort took too much effort. So let's look at some blurbs. Here's inappropriate time for ham. Oh, jeez. Okay, let's try a steep price for pie. Um, okay, forget that one. How about what a scoop? Oh, Christ. Uh, here's Riddler's Gammon. It's about some kind of jester doing... who cares. Moving on, we have Unwarranted Parade. I guess these all can't be winners. Robo Boners isn't very interesting either, other than the fact it makes you think about erections. Three cheers for steak! I'm sure someone out there thinks this is hilarious. But now onto the blurbs that actually matter. Just kidding, here's zoo smells. Yep, that's the joke. Men infatuated with smelling zoo animals. Here's the best blurb for last. And by best, I mean worst. Human animals. I think this one speaks for itself. Alright, let's look at the scriblets. The comics here were just whatever random joke Hussey could think of. Like, a black guy dunking his welfare check. Or a black guy dunking himself into jail. Or a black guy dressing up as a fat black woman. Or a black guy named Lil' Cal getting adopted by some white guy despite being an adult. Or a white guy getting jungle fever. Or frumpy lesbians getting it on. Or something called the rape mill. Or Hitler eating a cake. Or making fun of Tony Shalhoub. Damn, now he's gone too far. Team Special Olympics was really great. Now, if you were a fan, you could discuss these great comics on the Gang Bunch Fora. Hussey got up to some shenanigans here as well. Behold, Cheerful Bear Play Me. This is an altercation that Hussey had with the Jigsaw Killer. You see, Jigsaw wanted some Muppet Baby smut, and Hussey could do nothing but oblige him. But more importantly, the form was also the birthplace of what would become Hussey's most significant project in his entire life. On September 24th, 2006, Hussey began Jailbreak, the first in a series of what would become four MS Paint adventures. It started as a meager forum game. Basically, it was a mock text adventure. People would reply to the thread giving commands for the characters to do, and Hussey would play the role of the parser and use that command to further the story. Pretty innovative, no? Of course, being the first of such a format means that Jailbreak kind of sucks. As you might tell from the title, the goal of the game is to get a couple of prisoners to break free from jail. But Hussey felt obligated to use the first command submitted, so the resulting story generally makes no sense at all and is kind of disgusting. The prisoners are always peeing, shitting, puking, or dying in gruesome ways. And sometimes, the prisoners are already dead. There's also a dead whale on top of the prison, for some reason. The story even ends with one of the prisoners committing suicide at a stump in the woods. Man, there sure is a lot of death in this story. After that point, Hussey decided to do a complete restart. The story turns into something about elves, a horse, and kidnapping children. There's even gay pornography that gets forged into a formidable blade. I don't know. Somehow it makes even less sense. Also, I think you can tell why this series is called MS Paint Adventures. Well, you're looking at the only panel ever actually done in MS Paint. Hussey switched to Photoshop immediately after this one, since it has layers and shit. I think the biggest visual problem is you can't even tell the prisoners apart. They don't even have names. As we've seen earlier, Hussey was actually a great artist. He just didn't care about making this look good. After all, it was just a silly forum game that all of 10 people were probably gonna see. So I guess if there's something to be said about Jailbreak, it's that it laid the foundation for MSPA. Sure, it's not great, but I guess you need a baseline to start with. I'd recommend reading only the first four pages though. The longest running jokes on the website were established here. First, the prisoner is commanded to use the pumpkin in the room, only for it to disappear and the narration asks, what pumpkin? We later find out that something called the Pumpkin of Purifier swiped it. But Hussey, of course, did this to fuck with the readers first and foremost. Anyway, the fourth page is a command for the prisoner to grow arms, only for the narration to say, He already has arms, stupid! This would also come up a lot in the succeeding stories. 
Hussey likes to not draw arms on characters, so readers would suggest to get arms, then Hussey would lambast the readers for not understanding his stylistic art choice of not drawing arms. Hussey's kind of a dick. On June 3rd, 2007, Hussey moved Jailbreak over to a dedicated site. Evidently, he saw the potential in MSPA. Around this time, he ceased production of Team Special Olympics as well. Later, on June 12th, Hussey launched Bard Quest, the first adventure on this new site. Reader commands would be submitted through an integrated suggestion box this time. Hussey would experiment with the format with this story. Instead of just picking the first suggestion and rolling with it, Hussey decided to pick a bunch of commands and have branching paths on almost every page. Now, Jailbreak did have a branching path at one point, where you could choose which prisoner you wanted to follow. The path there eventually converged though. But Bard Quest's branching paths were its main feature. Hussey's goal was to make it a choose-your-own-adventure. However, this approach was flawed. Since the branching paths also branched as well, this made the story harder to follow, and it led to exponentially more work for Hussey. So, most branching paths were dead ends. Quite literally. Hussey did try to eliminate confusion by having a branching path map, but this effort was ultimately futile. Since this experiment was failing, Bard Quest didn't get very far. Here's the entire plot. You see, the king is a homosexual, like a lot of the MSPA characters. Anyway, the king enlists the bard to go slay a dragon. So the bard steals a codpiece and gains two followers, nicknamed Flothers and Donchi. They meet a swamp wizard, who is the most useless character on the entire website, which is really saying something. And that's where the story ends. Bard Quest is probably the worst adventure, mostly due to its short length and lack of impact. It's only 47 pages compared to Jailbreak's 134. Luckily, the next adventure would more than make up for it. On July 5th, 2007, Hussey put the site on hiatus, the first of several in the website's history. Though no one seems to acknowledge this but me. It lasted until March 10th, 2008. On that day, he debuted a new adventure called Problem Sleuth. This story went back to being mostly linear, with only a few branching paths to serve the purpose of telling quick jokes. Also, Hussey picked reader commands as he saw fit, so he was able to have more control over the direction of the story. As a result, Hussey actually saw it through to the end. Problem Sleuth ran for an entire year and consisted of 1,673 pages. That's a little over four pages every day. One thing that definitely evolved over the course of the story was the art. It started off as simple as ever, but over time the visuals got a lot more complicated. Hussey also realized that Photoshop could be used to make GIFs, so he started incorporating more and more animations. What started off static eventually became full of movement. Problem Sleuth could be looked at as a prototype for what Homestuck would eventually become. Though I think, overall, it's a better webcomic. Homestuck may have had higher highs, but it also had much lower lows. Problem Sleuth was at least more consistent in its quality. It's a joy the whole way through. It's also the story that led to the first wave of popularity that the franchise would see. I'm sure that there were some fans that crossed over from the Team Special Olympic days, but the wider web would first notice Hussey because of Problem Sleuth. It was linked on VGCats, for instance. That was a big webcomic at the time, let me tell you. The story got so popular that it started breaking the suggestion box, so Hussey moved command suggestions over to the comments section of one of his blog posts. So anyway, what was Problem Sleuth even about? Well, it's hard to explain. Like Homestuck, the story is pretty nuts. There wasn't any sort of planning for where the plot would go. It grew entirely and organically from the reader's suggestions. Mostly, the plot was an excuse for silly antics. The entire universe of Problem Sleuth runs on Looney Tunes logic. First off, there's actually a title screen to this comic, since it's supposed to be some sort of video game. Hussey made this to test out Flash. And do you hear that? That's the Problem Sleuth theme. It's composed by Mark Hadley. You might know him from making Slender. This is notably the first bit of official MSPA music. Anyway, let's begin. You are Problem Sleuth who is a hard-boiled detective who is living in a vaguely Prohibition-era city. He's got a, um, problem. He's trapped in his office. Not because his door is locked, but because a bust of Ben Stiller as David Starsky is blocking his door. Later on, some prostitutes steal bust Ben's sunglasses. Nothing in Problem Sleuth's office works like you'd expect. For example, he tries to get his gun, but it turns into a key. This is actually a common occurrence in the story. It's called Weapon-Object Duality. Next, the window on his door is actually a piece of paper. Then his safe has nothing important in it. It's just an enclosure for a clown painting which has peepholes which lets him spy into his neighbor's office. Of course, his neighbor can spy right back, but Problem Sleuth is ready with his candy corn vampire masquerade. Also, his desk is made of cinder blocks and particle board. 
Not to mention his phone is missing components. But perhaps most importantly, half his office is dedicated to this ethnically diverse mural. Okay, no, that's stupid. The actual most important thing is that his window isn't real. It's powered by electricity and actually looks into an imaginary universe. All of this complete idiocy is in service of the cat and mouse game between author and reader. Or to be more precise, Andrew Hussey's just an asshole. Problem Sleuth can access the imaginary universe in two ways, either by physically going there through the window, or by building a fort with pieces from his desk and imagining himself there. Hussey would later try to build a fort in real life, but it was too shitty. Guys, I need you to remember the sequence Star Heart Horseshoe. You better remember the sequence Star Heart Horseshoe. Problem Sleuth has two neighbors, who are also detectives. There's Ace Dick, who is small, very strong, and has a poor imagination. Then there's Pickle Inspector, who has a high tallness attribute, weak, but has a great imagination. And he's available. Problem Sleuth, of course, has middling stats, except he is high in paltritude, which gives him a lot of charisma, much like me. Each of them hate one another, and they often exchange unpleasant notes to express their disapproval. But they quickly realize they must all work together since they are all trapped. So after they escape from their respective offices, they find out that they're still stuck in the greater office building. So, the basic goal of the comic is to escape. At no point do these detectives actually investigate any capers. That's all outside, in the real world. But since they can't leave, most of the action takes place in the imaginary universe. The universe is split into two halves, connected by the Cathedral of Syndetic Ascension. On one half, we have the imaginary city. The city is a dangerous place, filled with frightening beasts. Our heroes, now nicknamed Team Sleuth, try to battle them, but they lose. It turns out that conventional weaponry doesn't seem to affect them. Luckily, Pickle Inspector can conjure up candy-based weapons. This makes our heroes pose as a team, cause shit just got real. The comic is also an RPG parody, so the battles have a lot of menus and convoluted stats. On the other half of the universe, we have the Four Kingdoms, which are the nations of elves, hogs, weasels, and clowns. These kingdoms are at war. Our three heroes all pick a side in the conflict. Problem Sleuth helps out the elves, Ace Dick helps out the hogs, and Pickle Inspector helps out the weasels. But who helps out the clowns? Well, there's a fourth player here. Our main antagonist, Mobster Kingpin. He's the local gangster that runs their criminal underworld. Hmm, a mob boss villain. Just like in Super Frog. Hey, Problem Sleuth also has a map like it did. Fascinating. Anyway, after our heroes and villain are done with their missions, the kingdoms reward them with the quest of spirit. This allows them to cognize female alter egos, who are like them in every way, except they have vaginas. The comic describes this as adhering to the deep-seated mythology that dictates that any man secretly wishes to have sex with a female version of himself. See Alvin and the Chipmunks, Mickey slash Minnie, etc. Prowl and Sleuth's counterpart is Hysterical Dame, Pickle Inspector's is Nervous Broad, Mobster Kingpin's is Madame Mural, and Ace Sticks is himself, because his imagination sucks. Sucks dick, that is. So now we have two Ace Sticks running around. In addition to that, Problem Sleuth uses a cheat code that loads an earlier part of the story, and this results in another Ace Stick. Now we have three Ace Sticks! To differentiate between them, one of them gets zombified, and one of them uses alchemy involving punch cards to create Five Alarm Hot Sauce, which he drinks and becomes Fiesta Ace Stick. Speaking of multiple versions of characters, Pickle Inspector's high imagination lets him keep an imaginary self alongside his real self. His imaginary self can clone himself too. Most of his clones die, however. But one of the clones ascends to Godhood, becoming Godhead Pickle Inspector. Another clone splits himself again, but this time sending one of the copies into the past, and the other into the future. The past one enters the real world and dies, but the future one reappears later. Problem Sleuth would eventually end the war between the kingdoms entirely with his paltritude skills. Also the fact he looked up another cheat code in a game facts guide. Anyway, our heroes then decide to make their way up to Mobster Kingpin's office. They enter his tower through a set of doors that require their own skulls to unlock. Along the way, they fight many enemies, including a Lovecraftian monster named Flathulu. This unpleasant beast gets summoned when Pickle Inspector shoves two window portals together. They also fight people from the ethnically diverse mural. You're normally an advocate of diversity and strong sense of community, but this is one cultural rainbow that you wish would go fuck off. When they reach Mobster Kingpin's office, they're able to exit into the imaginary universe on his flying ship, the Chicago Overcoat. The ship's captain is a bust of Snoop Dogg from Soul Plane which is a terrible movie that I for some reason own. Mobster Kingpin can also have an imaginary self alongside his real self. So the imaginary one descends to demonhood and becomes Demon Head Mobster Kingpin, or DMK for short. 
The entire second half of the comic revolves around battling him. Everyone gets involved. DMK is diabetic, so his defenses get lowered when you feed him candy. The Ace Dicks attack him by doing the Truffle Shuffle. DMK cures his diabetes, and now his defenses can only be lowered with emotions. Ace Dick climbs on his hat and plays the game of life with Death. Yes, Death himself is in the story, and people keep leaving the afterlife by walking through his door, which upsets him quite a bit. Dying is very meaningless in this comic. At this point, DMK makes his own attack. He rips the entire imaginary universe apart, revealing extra-dimensional cosmic superstring strata. GPI must repair the damage by sewing it back together. So what can our heroes possibly do? Well, to attack, they need that emotions gauge up. And that's where Ace Dick's little adventure comes in. At first, Ace Dick wins at life. He gets married, has a son, and forms his own criminal empire. But he slowly loses it all. His empire collapses, his wife and son both die, he passes by the Swamp Wizard, and eventually he commits suicide at the stump. Speaking of jailbreak callbacks, we find out that not only did Zombie Ace Dick summon the whale that's dead on top of the prison, but he's also one of the already dead prisoners. Wow, I'm glad we solved that mystery. Anyway, this all raises Demon Head Mobster Kingpin's emotions, leaving him vulnerable. The imaginary Future Pickle Inspector attacks next. He splits again, and now Past Future Pickle Inspector and Future Future Pickle Inspector work in tandem to create a part pickle collider. Yeah, there's a lot of stupid physics puns at this part. Eventually, Godhead Pickle Inspector would call on these part pickles to split infinitely, becoming all matter throughout history. This is how he created the universe. In the third and final phase, not even emotions will lower DMK's defenses. This is a problem, you could say. But before we sleuth that, you might be wondering what the women are up to. I just wonder what the women are up to. Well, Nervous Broad and Hysterical Dame end up fighting Madame Mural. Hysterical Dame attacks her using some lipstick that turns into a chainsaw. Wow, what a cool weapon. Nervous Broad picks up Ben Stiller's shades, since the prostitutes left them on the ground. The three ladies all have special corsets. Tightening or loosening the strings have different effects. Nervous Broad can adjust her aspect ratio, Hysterical Dame can adjust her scale, and Madame Mural can't do anything because her corset was stolen by a regular mobster kingpin. He can shrink his volume and increase his mass. He does this so much that he eventually forms a black hole. The women all get pulled into its event horizon. Nervous Broad wears stiller shades and sees everything happening at the universe at once. This would leave a permanent cosmic imprint on those sunglasses. Meanwhile, DMK grows a million health bars. This makes the MSPA reader consider suicide. Oh, not yet, my little audience surrogate. Problem Sleuth unleashes his ultimate attack, Sepultritude. This is a pretty hype moment. Just look at those gifts. He attacks the health bars directly, and eventually the demon is almost killed. Problem Sleuth's attack was too much, and he is significantly weakened. Captain Snoop deals the almost final blow, and Problem Sleuth must now make the ultimate sacrifice. He has to give up the candy corn that he had since the beginning of the comic to kill the demon for good. The black hole explodes and Mobster Kingpin is launched straight into a giant needle, and he can't escape from the afterlife since death blocked the door. Problem Sleuth almost perishes, but he is kissed back to life by Hysterical Dame. Ace Dick absorbs the other Ace Dicks to become... My God! Ace Dick! He grabs the Megaton key that Mobster Kingpin had, and our heroes finally leave their office building. <sighs> that was a lot. I hope you followed all that. Yeah, Problem Sleuth runs on pure nonsense, I can't stress that enough. But it's pretty entertaining and very funny. The comic is built upon callbacks and running gags fueling convoluted systems, and has very satisfying payoffs to incredibly stupid setups. I can't think of any better way to describe Problem Sleuth or MSPA in general. But yeah, this could get confusing. Luckily, Hussey wrote up a science fact about how this shit allegedly makes sense, but doesn't really. Anyway, if you wanted more Problem Sleuth content, then you're in luck. There's a bunch of non-canonical commands fueled by fan donations. That's right, if you made the poor financial decision to give Andrew Hussey your money, then he'd draw any command that you wanted. Most of these custom commands were pretty inconsequential. Pose with a little white cat because shit just got cute. Though I like the one with Hump Rump the Gathering. The most significant of these commands revolved around fan-created characters called the Midnight Crew. They were a bunch of shadowy card-themed mobsters. The group consisted of Spade Slick, Diamonds Droog, Hearts Boxcars, and Clubs Deuce. Team Sleuth had to fight them, and they did so extremely poorly. Not even the Warhammer of Zillyhu could stop them. Or maybe it could, they weren't actually in that suggestion. But the Catanative Doomsday Dice Cascader couldn't. Using dice, it can deal up to 50 trillion damage. They rolled a 1. 
Anyway, as I mentioned earlier, Problem Sleuth ran for exactly one year, from March 10th, 2008 to March 10th, 2009. Hussey planned to start the next adventure one month from that date, on April 10th. In the meantime, he found out that the ethnically diverse mural was only 15 minutes from where he lived, so he made a pilgrimage to see it in the flesh. He also ran an epilogue that tied up whatever loose ends were left in the story. Except for toppling sacred urns, desecrating mystic runes, and defiling hallowed tombs, I guess. The reaction to this ending was overwhelmingly positive. In an interview, Hussey had this to say about the great feedback. It's been an incredible response, far beyond my expectations. The sense I've come away with is that people actually like it when things have a proper ending. It's not uncommon for things on the internet to end, but it seems more usually to be characterized by a petering out, which is less well received. Tying up the loose ends makes all the difference. It's a model of storytelling that I will strive to repeat. Though everyone praised the ending, there was a sense of bittersweetness in the air. Team Sleuth wasn't going to get up to their antics anymore. Many people would have been fine with a sequel, but it was time for a brand new story. With new characters getting up to their own antics. And what was that story going to be about? Well, during the last few months of Problem Sleuth's production, Hussey started getting ideas. He visualized a kid manipulating another kid's room as if it were The Sims. But maybe it wouldn't be just two kids. Maybe there would be four of them. He looked at how Godhead Pickle Inspector created the universe, and the idea of a much more complicated creation myth started to form. The readers had no idea what they were in for. Problem Sleuth at the time was considered Hussey's magnum opus. What could have possibly topped it? On the last page, Team Sleuth posed as a team, and one final image was linked. Death simply asked you if you wanted to play another game. Ah yes, another game. Maybe one involving kids and houses. We'll get to that one next time. Hey, thanks for watching the first part of my Homestuck review. I know I spoke for over a half an hour and I haven't even talked about Homestuck yet, but that's just how complicated this shit is. If you want to support me, please consider subscribing or leaving a like or leaving a comment. I'll be working on the next part in the meantime. See you then.